about a half an hour. Is that going to be good for you? Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Great. Oh, and I yeah. can see you now too. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So I um, probably don't have a, a whole lot of content, but I also do know that um, the wildlife section can lead to a lot of questions. So to make sure we have question time, that should be um, that should work out fine. I think. Perfect. Thank you. Hey. All right. Well. Um, Thanks everyone who's here today. It looks like we have a lot of people here in attendance and I um, suspect that a lot of people are returning um, folks who are familiar with the the research and kind of longevity of our project here. But just to give a really, you know, broad brush um, overview, um, I oversee our wolf and caribou long-term research and monitoring projects in the park. And these uh, these research projects have been going on since the mid 80s. Um, so there's a long history of kind of parallel research of both our wolf population and our caribou population that continues today. So there's really kind of this rich legacy um, history of of the management we've doing. And I'm not going to go into um, a whole lot of detail about that background, but more provide kind of an update about that. Um, I have some other talks and some that are probably recorded. I did one earlier this March that goes into a little bit more of kind of the, the broad history and that um, can be made available if people are interested as well. Um, and I just want to start a little bit, I think, um, talking about, uh, you know, land acknowledgements can be, uh, you know, something that that people are are becoming more aware of. And I, I just want to say that as I talk about, you know, our knowledge or our um, understanding of these animals that you know it's it's not to um negate or ignore this like vast history of traditional ecological knowledge uh, about these creatures that really predate our research here and um you know continues to be an important source of our knowledge and understanding and uh, you know a huge basis for respect for wildlife today <clears throat> so uh Again, for people who are maybe a little bit less familiar, a broad uh, overview of what we do in um, for our wolf and caribou research. Every year we go out and we're trying to outfit um, one to three wolves within each pack that predominantly resides within the park study area with GPS collars. So these collars are really kind of <clears throat> the technology that's emerged since the days of, you know, um, just walking around with hiking boots and binoculars, which is, you know, a great way to gain ecological knowledge. But for us to really get a broad scale population level perspective on what's going out there, tools like um, radio collars really help us uh, um, be able to track wildlife, uh, both from the air to get visuals, um, but also like Pat mentioned from now sitting at our, our desk and pulling up a map and getting a, a big picture of what's going on with movements of animals in the park. So we're monitoring movements, uh, space use. Uh, we also can <clears throat> use these collars to help us relocate and monitor, you know, pack size, who are with uh, these wolves, um, what are they preying on, and the reproduction, so they're denning um, and how many pups they're producing and how many of those individuals are recruited into the population. We've also been deploying trail cameras for a number of years now. These have really been a, a great non-invasive tool, something that we can leave out in den sites that have been used <clears throat> in previous years since packs tend to show some fidelity to den site year to year. And we just leave them out for a whole year, see if the wolf pack comes back. And if so, there's a camera there that can collect some um, really interesting information. We can get really early um, denning uh, dates when they actually whelp, when puppies first come out and early pup counts as well. So that's been really valuable. In the wintertime, we can also put these cameras out at kill sites and that provides some information about um, about uh, wolf use of uh, carcass sites, but also of interspecies interactions at those sites. Um, and then continued data collection and analysis on factors that influence the ability of wolves along the park road. You know, our park is one of the few areas in the world that's known for the ability to see wild wolves. Um, this is a, a kind of a valuable attribute and something that we collect data on and are monitoring in different ways <clears throat> over time. 
Um, for our caribou project, uh, we maintain an age-structured radio collar sample of cows within our Denali caribou herd. So the Denali caribou herd is this resident herd. It's resident and nomadic, primarily the entire herd range residing within the park boundaries, um, with exceptions out, notably in the Wolf Corridor and a little bit to the south as well. Um, and one unique aspect of this project is that we have collars on every age of cow in that herd. So we get age specific survival and reproduction rates. And that's a really unique thing for uh, caribou research worldwide. So it really sets this project apart. So every year we go out and we do conduct pregnancy, post-pregnancy, and then fall composition counts, um, which I'll feed into again, our estimates of um, annual demography and uh, tracking the population trajectory over time. And then another part is conducting outreach and education on wildlife and wildlife research in Denali. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the role of climate um, and how we are seeing some changes in climate over time. And some people who um, maybe are coming in from other areas outside of Alaska um, are still probably aware that we've had some severe um, conditions in the past few years. And if anyone's here now, just looking outside, if you're in the Denali area, there's still quite a bit of snow on the ground. So, um, but there's been a series of years where we've had some kind of uh, more notable uh, conditions. So we had um, 2019 was a really cold winter, um, 2020 was a really cold and snowy March. So we had, you know, second snowiest March on record, um, and the snow depth at Park Headquarters was about normal, but then the snow depth out west at Kantishna was, you know, almost 200% of normal. And then this past winter where we had historic um, December snow and rain records, um, the highest snow depth on record, and the wettest December, and um, we still have a lot of that snow on the ground here, which means for a, a later um, snow off date. And these climatic conditions in the winter can have pretty significant impacts for um, our ungulate populations and for their predators. So taking a look, this um, shows our caribou herd size. So that's the Denali caribou herd size over the trajectory of monitoring from the mid 1980s to uh, 2021. <clears throat> and then our wolf density is in that solid black line beneath. So if you look at the early years of this study and like the mid kind of early 90s, you see that there was like this high or this peak of caribou um, herd size, which then declined pretty rapidly. And that was in response to a series of winters with really deep snow. Really deep snow has this kind of one-two punch of both reducing mobility for caribou um, and also reducing their access to nutrition. So you can see this kind of lagged response of the wolf um, numbers that kind of respond to that and taking advantage of more vulnerable prey um, given these conditions. And we almost see a bit of a parallel in the recent years. If you go to the other side of the graph, on the right-hand side where the caribou um, herd has was uh, in a period of slow but kind of consistent growth. And then we've seen a pretty significant decline in recent years, um, again, probably attributed to some of these winter time conditions. So this is looking just at, again, of our herd size estimate and then our estimate of cows in the herd um, from the time period of like 1986 to 2001. So in the previous year, we had 35 caribou that we collared or recollared, and our preliminary fall hearse estimate for last September was about 2,200. So, you know, again, it's indicating that at a decreasing stage right now. And this is, this decrease is, you know, coming in two parts. We're not adding as many calves, right? So calf survival was pretty low. The average calf survival has been about 25%, and that was down to about 11% last year. So this is the second year in a row where we've had really low calf survival. And then again, for the second year in a row, uh, cow mortality was also high. So the adults in the herd are also not surviving and, and um, dying at a higher rate. Um, again, this was about uh, annual mortality rate of about 23% for adult females, the second highest mortality rate, and then greater than our long-term study average of about 11%. We look at um, what's happened with wolves in 
kind of the past few years. So this is just looking at um, our metric of mean pack size and how that's varied um, in that solid line. And then our, our density estimate, which density can be a little problematic, but it is kind of a metric of, of change within our population over time. Um, and you can see that we've kind of had a little uh, kind of uptick in this recent years. Um, we've had, so our spring count was 96 wolves and 13 packs. So uh, more packs was in the park. Uh, we've had some larger packs as well. So Grant Creek was up to 22 this winter. They're at like 18 right now this spring. So a pretty large pack. Um, we had, let's see, we, we in 2021, we had 22 wolves that we collared or recollared. And this includes a couple new packs. So last fall, we found a new pack out in the kind of Shushana Stampede Corridor area called the Hannah Pack. And we found three new packs in um, the spring. Uh, the Dry Creek pack, we're actually not sure if they're localizing completely outside of the park or in the park. They were in the park when we found them. They may have shifted a little bit outside. Uh, we have the Thumb pack, uh, which does appear to be inside the park, but kind of in the outer range. And then um, the Squeeze pack down in the kind of southwestern portion of the park. We did last um, year have a, a wolf we you know, called the tripod wolf. There was a wolf that we had located just by finding a really odd track that we were trying to figure out what it was. It turned out to be a wolf that had a, a trap um, that had been, it had, was not attached to a trap anymore and it was dragging a trap on its leg, uh, a leg hole trap around. And so we were able to um, sedate that wolf, remove the, and remove the trap. And it actually has moved outside of the park just to the north side of the park and it's now with a group of six but that's he's been going strong uh, for about a year now um, another cool thing this year we put out a video caller so we put a video caller on one of the riley creek um, wolves and this caller will be on for about 16 weeks and it'll collect snippets um, basically video snippets where we'll actually see some of the activity as kind of seen from the wolf. So this will be a really neat thing to collect in July and hopefully have some really great products to show um, a little bit more of what it looks like from the wolf's perspective. Um, this is some uh, updates from 2021. These are our spring and fall pack counts and our metrics of reproduction. And then I know questions of mortality and human cause mortality are um, come up. And so we did have five cases of um, of human caused mortality in the previous year. Um, a few wolves were killed after, uh, harvested after dispersing, and some were harvested just outside. These were legal harvests, um, but outside the boundary of the park when wolves um, who primarily resided within the park traveled outside. Here's our spring 2022 wolf map. You can see our um, kind of the, the general territories of all the different packs. And you can see, I know a question for uh, this group, there can be some interest in, hey, you know, what are the packs along the road? Who might we see this year? So the Rex pack has actually been using some habitat along the road corridor um, and they may continue to do so. Although last summer they tended to use areas south of the park road and not really venture up this far north. So it remains to be seen if, if they'll maintain that pattern or not. The Riley Creek Pack um, has a lot of territory kind of bouncing over the road. They uh, may choose to den along the Teclanica again, which is a, a location that kind of means uh, some of their uh, activities might be centered a little bit more around the, the road corridor. Uh, we don't have any evidence or knowledge of where any of these uh, packs are denning to date. I imagine they're going to have uh, quite a bit of work cut out for them digging out their den sites this year. <laughs> Grant Creek Pack has a really big range, a really big territory. Some of it does overlap the park road, but <clears throat> really uh, they haven't used much of the road corridor habitat in previous years. If they do, it's a, a little bit further along the western side, so that might be an area that's not, uh, not visible for visitors this year. And then North Face, you see that kind of overlap along the park road, but that's a single wolf right now and um, remains to be seen if if he'll locate with someone else or not. I'm going to move on and give a little bit of update about sheep. So <clears throat> for the past few years, we've been conducting aerial surveys for sheep doing distance sampling uh, techniques. And um, 
if you look at these raw numbers, the numbers on the top of the bars are just the total, the estimate of the total um, size <clears throat> of our population within our survey area. And there are some that seem a little kind of wonky, maybe a little out there, like 2016, we're not quite sure if that survey results were were really verifiable. That seems a little uh, that seems a little erroneous. And then we're also a little, you know, we are wondering about that 2020 number where it does seem like, again, there was kind of a pretty significant decrease. Um, and I, we're planning on doing a survey again this year, so that'll lend a little bit more information on it, whether that's uh, an anomaly or not, but it wouldn't be un um, unexpected that, that we obviously have had some drop in the sheep population given some of the late um, late snow springs that we've had and knowing that the late um, snow on dates for sheep can be particularly problematic, um, you know, just reduces their ability to get good forage and nutrition when they are lambing and trying to um, trying to raise in, uh, the new recruits of, of lambs in the year. So uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have more information after this summer's survey. And then one other <clears throat> point um, I wanted to discuss briefly was a project that is going on uh, with the University of Washington researcher uh, Laura Pru and her grad student. And here we have uh, Jake, who some of you may know <laughs> as a bear tech, who is helping with this uh, snow survey this year. So the this project is aimed at going out and trying to improve our the information we have about snow conditions out um, in wildlife habitat and in our study areas. Right now, we kind of have course metrics of snow conditions as, you know, cumulative snowfall at headquarters or Cantitian or other snow tell sites. But it doesn't necessarily give uh, a really accurate picture of like what animals are experiencing, you know, up in the high alpine, for example, where doll sheep are. We found some really interesting things. When you actually go out and you pair information about the snow characteristics at uh, animal track sites, like we see here, this little um, graphic, it says a sink depth of doll sheep tracks and then the density of the snow. And what they found is that there's kind of this critical threshold where if you get dense snow, they can suddenly travel on top of it. So there's this like ease of travel that's happening with really dense snow right there. Um, but then we also know there's probably a trade off with that really dense snow providing some sort of, um, you know, that that dense snow could be kind of compacted on top of food resources as well. So getting more detailed information about um, snow characteristics and uh, modeling the variability of snow more accurately across our landscape is going to be really beneficial for any future analysis on wildlife movements and understanding what some of the impacts of snow characteristics are towards um, both animal movements, but also animal uh, uh, fitness and survival. So that'll also be going on uh, that start did this past winter um, and will be going on in the next year as well. So with that, <clears throat> I'll kind of wrap things up here. Um, and I will, let's see, I'll point to our Wolves website, which we will be posting um, more updates. We'll have our annual report up shortly, as well as our spring uh, uh, pack narratives. And if anyone has any questions, we can go ahead with that now.